Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, this panel session. Uh, we have a terrific panel for you this morning. Um, and the topic is about the, uh, the social impact and uh, solving social challenges through uh, blockchain. Um, my name is Tony Malati. I uh, lead our uh, financial services consulting practice for Gartner Consulting. I'm based here in Toronto. And uh, we're going to uh, explore some interesting examples of what are some of those social challenges that seem to be uh, you know, well-placed well to be able to tackle uh, using a distributed ledger and uh, blockchain technology. Uh, so I'd, uh, before we uh, kick off with the questions, I'd like to uh, have each of the panel members uh, introduce themselves to you. Leon? Ah, good morning, thank you. Uh, Leon Perlman from uh, Columbia University uh, Business School in New York. Uh, I had the new uh, Digital Financial Services Observatory, which is a, a policy uh, institute and uh, looking at the um, issues around the digital economy, especially in the developing world. So I do have a developing world um, focus. Um, I've also been the, uh, the uh, chair of the DFS working group through the ITU, Finance by Gate, uh, which has had a three-year lifespan. So I, I headed that, that group and did quite a bit of work on blockchain and financial inclusion. And um, the successor to that group is, uh, has, was formed about a month ago, um, or announced about a month ago. It's called FIGI, Financial Inclusion Global Initiative. Uh, and I'm heading uh, the, the blockchain initiative there that's in conjunction with BIS, World Bank, uh, Gates, and ITU. So a lot, a lot of embedded stuff with blockchain, and I also uh, work with a lot of regulators around the world trying to help them figure out what this blockchain thing is. That's great. And, and how it helps them. Thanks. Henry? Hi, everyone. My name is Henry Chan. I'm a product manager at Consensus. Uh, Consensus is a Ethereum-based company based out of New York. I'm based in the Toronto office. I'm a product manager at Consensus, leading our Wayfund platform, which is a crowdfunding solution. Uh, prior to joining Consensus, I co-founded the Deloitte blockchain practice in Canada. Hi, everybody. My name is Agi Sinsuri. I am the founder of U.Cash, which is a startup working in the blockchain industry to distribute banking. Uh, we're working with money service businesses and utilizing a blockchain technology layer and mobile applications to bring financial services to people in remote areas. I'm also one of the board of directors on the Blockchain Association from Canada. Um, we, our mandate is to make Canada a thriving economy and jurisdiction for blockchain-based businesses. And I'm also one of the founders of the biggest blockchain meetups in Canada. Uh, we have events every few months. Our last event drew about 800 people. Thank you very much. So uh, before we get into the, the how and the why, um, I thought we'd start with a few examples of uh, social impact initiatives or social challenges that, uh, that you've seen uh, or have been involved in, in working in around the world. So uh, uh, can we start with you, Sanjeev? Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah. One of the biggest problems that I see worldwide for social impact challenges is uh, the access to digital identity and um, a way to use that as a foundational layer to get access to financial services in the global economy. Uh, we have countries that have no access to infrastructure, that have low levels of government facilities, and even countries that are war-torn, that where people don't have any government identities or passports to build their lives on. So this, is, I personally believe, is one of the biggest issues. Uh, another issue that we're facing as well worldwide is the access to global capital to build businesses and blockchain technology allows people worldwide to be able to offer services based on blockchain technology and have a global audience. And uh, I understand uh, there's also a new initiative, Henry, that uh, with the uh, consensus that's uh, kicking off and it actually has the name of uh, Blockchain for Social Good. Yeah, so consensus, we recently kicked off an initiative called uh, Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition, which is a, a new group that's encouraging uh, companies to, to uh, explore what it means for blockchain to be in the social impact area. 
Uh, and we're just, we just kicked off this group about a week ago, and this summer we're starting a hackathon um, focused on four key main areas on digital identities, supply chain, uh, the environment, and financial inclusion, uh, which will lead up to a bigger conference in October, uh, which will um, gather more funding to, to incubate these startups, these uh, ideas um, to form companies. And uh, Leon, you mentioned you uh, focus a lot on uh, developing initiatives, developing countries and uh, social challenges there. Could you give us some examples of those? Yes, well, I, I, as I said, the, the new initiative, uh, the collegial initiative between the, the SSB, standard setting bodies, and Gates uh, is, is pretty important because that's going to be a top-down approach. Um, so where this impacts is the, the regulations, because it's all very well developing these systems and then you land in the country and uh, you try and launch it and the regulator says, um, you know, what is this? We use another term. Um, and in, in my, uh, I, I travel a lot to these countries and I always ask them the same capacity building questions is what is blockchain, DLT, and they, most of these chaps don't uh, know what it is. Um, and you don't know what you don't know. So you can't regulate it properly or if you do regulate it, you do a very poor job. Um, the, the, especially in the financial sector, your, you know, your leading uh, regulator would be the central bank. But in a blockchain universe, which is a sort of an omnibus uh, um, type of, of system, you need a whole lot of regulatory coordination, not just the central bank. So you need possibly your telecoms regulator, your uh, regulator doing uh, ID systems, internal affairs, uh, competition regulator, because, you know, what happens if somebody goes on a blockchain and locks, locks a smaller player out for whatever reason. So there's a whole lot of people that need to be coordinated. Um, and then you get the, the trickle down social, social impact. And to that point, um, it's not just the developing countries that could, may get it wrong. Mm. It's the developed countries that may get it wrong. So if you, you're seeing uh, the blockchain laws at a, sta a US state level that are being passed, um, I look at it from my, my, my legal viewpoint and say, Guys, did you not read the, did you not do a due diligence on the laws that you've just defined? So Arizona, for example, went and defined blockchain in a very interesting way. Um, so if you're an innovator, you can out-innovate the law almost immediately simply because the legislature, uh, legislators don't have insight into, into the blockchain. It needs to be a technology neutral definition and they've made it not technology neutral. So that's the lesson I take to the, to the developing countries so that if they are going to implement something or not stop uh, mm -hmm. innovation for social good, then they need to be aware of, uh, of what it is and how to coordinate between regulators. Right. So that's the trickle-down approach. So on the, uh, on the question of identity, which I guess governments are, uh, have a, a role to play, central institutions traditionally have a role to play in that, and that's the recognized way of uh, confirming one's identity. So that's kind of one of the basic foundational pieces that needs to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, in the context of social issues and social challenges, whether we're talking at home uh, here with, uh, you know, a homeless person that needs to access uh, health, uh, even get in the job uh, market, et cetera, uh, or in remote areas, whether it's in developing countries or not, there's a, that's a fundamental building block. How, how are you seeing that being addressed through, uh, through blockchain? Um, personally, I believe that there's going to be many different identity solutions that are going to be built based on blockchain technology and distributed like their technology over the next few years. Um, one or a few of them will take off internationally and become major brands and start offering services to people for them to access their identity and access value-added services using that identity. Um, that is probably still seven or eight years out from now. Uh, but once this starts happening, we're going to see people in impoverished nations, people in countries that don't have access to uh, economies, like digital economies, start utilizing these to leapfrog our countries. And solutions like Uport that you were talking about earlier and uh, digital identity are kind of the placemakers and 
the proof of concepts, but we haven't seen the final solution just yet. I mean, there are, there are some identity solutions out there in the developing world. I mean, they, they, they you know, they, as you said, they're, they're different paradigms. You can have self-sovereign identity, you can have federated identity, you can have centralized identity, onboarding. I would differentiate between the, the onboarding and the, and the use. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two distinct uh, use, use cases for, for, for blockchain, but on a blockchain. Um, so the, the onboarding, I think in the developing world, there's a, there's a great opportunity. Because identity, and especially KYC, that's required now, FATF, uh, financial action task force, mm -hmm. is, you know, it, it, it has its eye on the developing world, and there's a lot of de-risking going on, because the KYC controls are not in place, because you don't know anybody's identity. So remittances to developing nations are drying up, because banks just won't allow you to send money to those countries, because they don't know who's receiving it. No bank wants to be the next CNN headline is, we sent uh, money to X country and they bought hand grenades, which were used to yep. do something. So, that, so rather de-risk is the, is the default position now. So if you start developing proper blockchain-based uh, 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 identity solutions, or even as you've got in India, which is the Aadhaar system, which unfortunately has been uh, compromised, um, that's got, you know, I think close to a billion people on there already. Mm. Um, th 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 that's, a, that's a milestone to the identity solution. Um, what's important about, th so that's the onboarding process and stopping the de-risking uh, hysteria in, in some respects. Yeah. Uh, but it's also allowing you to control what, you use, uh, what your identity is used for. So with blockchain and maybe Ada is, uh, is, is, uh, is non-blockchain incarnation with its, its box of uses, uh, is a paradigm, you can say, okay, you can use my identity for five hours for such and such a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to credit verify me or you want to check something or you want to use me for market research, you, you, can, you can at a very granular level fine tune the uses and switch those permissions on and off. Right. Um, you know, that, that, that is the next step, is the actual control of your control of the use of your identity. And I think blockchain is a, is a, is a, is a, is a good method for that. Yeah. So it's not really being used at the moment, but yeah. still, in theory. So is the, uh, you know, the concept of, uh, uh, you know, portable identity, uh, is that one of the advantages that you would also have for some of the developing countries that where you know, it's not maybe a, a paper document that you're carrying around with you, but... Uh... It, it's something, but I, I think in a lot of countries where they don't have national identity systems, mm. which leads to that all the way back to some bank in uh, Toronto or New York saying, well, let's de-risk, uh, it's, it, it's important. So I think blockchain allows a lot of onboarding and sharing of the, of the identity. So a bank could do the onboarding and share it with, with another bank and they would attest to the identity through the, uh, through the blockchain and make that uh, kind of portable. Um, I mean, the most interesting example I've seen where it's really, really needed in countries where they don't have identity systems is last year I was in Malawi, and uh, their KYC process is based on your address, right? Um, but there are no streets, right? So what you have to do, and I, I, I saw this with my own eyes. If I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. It's, you have to draw a map on a piece of paper of the, of the path going to your, your, basically your home in inverted commas, which is really a shack, and then draw a picture of the shack and hand, hand that in as your KYC document. Yep. Um, great opportunity is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so, the, I mean, we're, we're only touching the surface with uh, the identity uh, and some of the other uh, dimensions that uh, blockchain is addressing that we heard about this morning also is uh, the, uh, the, the intermediaries and how, uh, you know, there's a frictionless world, I guess, within blockchain where you can, uh, where you have uh, uh, disintermediation of some of those processes and, and conf confirmations and settlement, et cetera, when we're talking about a financial transaction. But in the, um, in, uh, in the social, challenges in the in, uh, aspect, how do we, how do we 
how do we apply uh, kind of solutions for uh, you know mitigating fraud, mitigating uh, uh, corruption, uh, and diversion of of the, the 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 assets that are meant to be going to uh, certain individuals or groups? Uh, well, issues such as fraud and um, corrupt governments are more social problems than they are technological problems. Uh, technology can help advert some of these issues and make it harder for people to fraud systems. Things like blockchain, which can use distributed consensus to come to agreements without the need for an intermediary. But there's always going to be problems along those with the last mile problem, because right now most economies in the third world are based on cash. And as long as systems are based on cash, uh, that's gonna lead to the use of that cash for lots of criminal activities and lead to lots of social problems. Uh, once you start moving things like um, currency, uh, data assets like um, your home ownership, your vehicle ownership, your identity to the blockchain, um, you now have the system which can operate without the need for a third party oversight. And I think that in itself, a combination of all these things is what's gonna lead to greater social impact and make changes and mitigate fraud, not entirely limited, but reduce it. I, I want to touch a bit about uh, a recent announcement from the UN uh, for their World Food Program, where they're using blockchain to enable faster uh, cash delivery. Um, and if you, if you understand cryptocurrency, it is a digital form of cash. So um, when we tie together your digital identity with a wallet, you're now able to push cash directly from uh, a pool of funds that the UN have in a matter of 15 seconds to the wallet of an, uh, a, a food bank um, in Uganda. Um, and, and not only do you have the efficiency of pushing the money, but you also eliminate some of the corruption uh, of the middleman when, uh, when the money moves between countries. Uh, but you also have the increased traceability on how the end node spends their money. As long as it remains on the blockchain rail, uh, you can have much greater, much richer data analytics um, around, around blockchain. Yeah. I mean, that's great. One thing I would caution is, in a lot of cases, blockchain relies on the veracity of the, inf or the input information. Uh, especially if you've got external sources that aren't on a blockchain, but you rely on them, say, a trigger for a smart contract, it's not blockchain-based. So blockchain even says the, the block is good, yay. It doesn't say the information is on the blockchain itself is bad. Right. And that's where I see a kind of an off-road into uh, the, the, um, the, the blockchain paradigm's uh, veracity of information, to, to, uh, if I can put it that way. Is it doesn't acknowledge the, truth, the, the truthfulness of the information that's put on it. Uh, and, and, that's where, and that's to me, you know, initiatives like that are great, but it's the input which, which can be manipulated. I think absolutely. I think the, the, the rigor around the smart contracts on what conditions get triggered, those can be hard-coded, but yeah. you're right, the, or, the oracles are the weakest link in, yeah. in the process. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we rely completely on autonomous oracles to make decisions. We can still have human interaction on to uh, have specific whitelisted accounts uh, on the blockchain to trigger these transactions, and that's still possible. Then we move away from the trustless, right? Well, some you? of these issues are actually being looked at right now. The use of oracles and making sure that trust and information is coming in from oracles can be mitigated by using game theory to come up with solutions to reward oracles that unanimously vote the same way, and then you have oracles that are bad actors that can, for example, lose their stake or some kind of money that they put in to get rewards for being an oracle. So there's ways, not just technologically, but you know, philosophically and mathematically that we can figure out how to make outside inputs work most of the time, not 100% of the time. I don't know if a solution for that exists just yet, but in the future I can see that happening. I think I like that point because if you will look at the prediction markets, which is a huge use case in blockchain right now, uh, we have Gnosis with Augur. Uh, their whole value proposition is to make sure that the, the data is valid uh, and 
end users need to stake their claim whenever they, they, they prove a prediction. Um, and if they were false in their claim, then they lose that money, mm -hmm. which is what they call crypto economics. It's a hugely it's powerful model of concept. PRT. That's what they're using, yeah. yeah. I think what that highlights, too, is that some of the, uh, you know, the, the way uh, some of the control mechanisms that we have today are, are not going to disappear just because we have uh, blockchain. The, the, the trust comes from knowing that what got on it is accurate in the first place. So, yeah. so some of the, the control and risk management uh, mechanisms and methods and, and validations are, are still going to need to be there. Um, at, at some point, any, uh, would that, Pers do you see it that um, way too? Uh, personally, I believe the, the existing infrastructure, so in Ontario, we have something called Service Ontario, where you go to get your driver's license, where you go to get your health card, and these existing organizations and locations can be used to attest your identity for digital purposes. So for example, you can go take your phone and be like, give me a digital attestation that this is who I am, and if you lose your phone later on, you can go back to Service Ontario with whatever else supporting documentation you have and get your identity back again. So existing infrastructure is not going to become obsolete. I think it's going to evolve. Uh, it's going to evolve to be a centralized system the way it is right now. Eventually going to be, become a hybrid system. You're going to have driver's licenses issued by you know, government Ontario, et cetera, et cetera. But you're also going to have digital identity systems that are going to be attested and proven by these Service Ontario locations to move on to the digital ecosystem. And eventually, in the next 10, 15 years, we may see an entirely digital system. Yep. Uh, I'd like to maybe go back uh, to uh, you know, the, the central uh, issue of uh, some of the social challenges. And, and I want a lot of the discussions that we've uh, been hearing about uh, are rather transactional in nature. Uh, you know, ensuring that everything is a-OK -okay from A to Z. Um, when we were talking earlier, there was uh, really uh, examples of uh, you know, where the richness of the data that's being uh, uh, shared through a distributed ledger uh, also brings value and creates value. And one of the examples we were discussing was uh, around agriculture, where uh, you know, collecting data about the weather, uh, linking that to uh, you know, the farmer who has to buy the seed, et cetera. Could you guys maybe elaborate a bit more on some of those yeah, data-rich examples where... There the, the, the are quite a few of them. Yeah. This is one of my favorite is, um, say, in East Africa, this is what's being done, is that um, not, not necessarily on the blockchain, but in, in almost there, it's not yeah. just almost in parallel, is that um, small farmers uh, are... are, are getting uh, micro-insurance for their crops. Um, and then basically, if, the, if, a, if there's a failure, they get automatic payment on, on, uh, on their mobile money account to their phone. No, no intervention. The way they, they, it's being done is very clever, very clever technology using mobile base stations. So without getting into the, the, the physics of it, so you've got one base station tower, another base station tower, they talk to each other as they do in a mesh network. That's how your comms work. And somebody's figured out an algorithm that if the signal between two base stations is attenuated or changed a little bit, it means there's something blocking the signal. And that usually is rain or fog or mildew or something. Yeah. So yes, it's been blocked, therefore within, and, and don't forget, these are small areas, micro areas, not, not your big satellite uh, views of, of, of weather patterns, you can say, well, in that valley, over a three-month period, there was, there was no attenuation of the signal, therefore there was no rain. Boom, therefore the small farmer's crop must have had some failure, therefore pay him out, or her. Um, and if you take that and then pay him out onto the phone automatically, into their mobile money account, doesn't need to file a claim form doesn't need to do anything. Now, if you extend that to the blockchain, um, where, again, the, the, the base station input is an external input, input it onto a smart contract, you can extrapolate that to, to many things, including the, the seeds that the farmer uses. So the farmer says, sells a product to, to uh, a, a chain store in, in, in Europe or the US or Canada and certifies it organic, yes. It's organic based on what was put into the blockchain. Yeah. 
if it's flowers, you can trace it all the way up to the, uh, the value chain and say, um, okay, there was a failure at this point. You can put a little IoT device in that reports back to the, the, um, to the blockchain that says there was a, along the shipping process, there was a temperature failure. So the, the cooling process didn't work. So all these paradigms along the value chain, the impact to the small farmer back in, in Kenya or in East Africa or wherever it is. And that's the potential of this. And the, that's, to an extent, that's already a reality, just not on the blockchain yet. But there's yeah. some very smart people already Working trying to that. do this, yes. So would it be fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, without generalizing, well, I am going to generalize. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, with, with some of those examples, they're, they're focusing on uh, communities that, you know, they're not so large. You could kind of put your arm around it and, and try to solve an issue for, for that community. Uh, if I compare that to some of the challenges and, and opportunities that we're working with in within financial services, it requires uh, scale, liquidity, participants to all be uh, working in, in in, in a synchronized fashion, which makes any kind of implementation uh, by its very nature more complex. Uh, does that mean that some of those social challenges we might be able to see a uh, 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 distributed ledger based solutions in, in that context perhaps before we see a lot of uh, deployment and adoption within kind of the, the, the more institutional world? In my opinion, I, th I think so. I think um, regulation is a key hurdle for a lot of innovations in the developed country. Um, and, and what I've seen uh, is that in Southeast Asia, where the, the regulations weren't as rigorous, uh, the innovations around blockchain or, or giving um, associating digital identity with your pr public private key, uh, these type of innovations um, are able to accelerate faster. Uh, because they don't have uh, the, 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 all the entities in Canada that govern around securities, et cetera. Yeah. I personally believe um, large-scale government blockchain um, endeavors and enterprise endeavors are going to get deployed at the same speed as small niche blockchain industry use cases um, because the technology is available for anybody to use. Uh, we're living in an era where blockchain technology, everything is open source. So uh, enterprise users and corporations and companies getting together to form consortiums have the access to the same technological research and development that's been done for the past few years on blockchain technology as somebody that's sitting in Africa with a little bit of you know, Python and Solidity knowledge. So uh, we're going to see these small use cases like what you're saying, farmers and uh, you know, oracles and betting and, and prediction markers and identity being built in tandem but also being able to work with bigger, larger scale enterprise and government endeavors because the technology is interoperable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, to a point, but I, I would say, speaking of sort of enterprise and government, the, you, you're seeing that nexus uh, work quite nicely in a lot of countries. I mean, there's an announcement every two weeks, some countries doing blockchain, filling the, do filling the you know, filling whatever the product is. Yeah. But where, where that seems to, uh, be housed is these these um, sandboxes. So we're seeing a lot of these fintech sandboxes. That's the new term. That's the term du jour, right? Yeah. Fintech sandboxes, fintech sandboxes. So yeah, put your blockchain in the sandbox, and we'll ring-fix all the uh, the issues around it, so it doesn't impact on the broader uh, ecosystem, be it financial or otherwise. And we have a sunset clause of a year's worth of testing, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we haven't you know, messed up the entire economy. So a lot of regulators are embracing that as a uh, commercial, to allow commercial players, but actually embracing that to allow governments to embrace it themselves for their own um, uh, uh, social, social uh, good needs. I personally believe um, sandboxes in themselves are a step in the right direction, but it is what it is, it, there, it's a box. Uh, so you're basically uh, getting blockchain technology, which is meant to be global in nature, uh, no regulations, code is law, and you're trying to put it into a box that fits the ideas 
of rules and laws that were created 60, 70 years ago in some cases, maybe even longer, so it's new technology. Uh, it's, it's a good idea, but I think the biggest innovations are gonna happen in edge industries, in places that you don't even, s won't have any boxes. Yeah. And those are gonna be black swan events. We're gonna see identity solutions come in that are gonna be global right away, but they might not be created by governments. They may be backed by governments in some ways, mm -hmm. but the real solutions that are gonna be world changing just, may or may not just, come Just from. to be clear, those sandboxes relax existing rules. Yeah. In anticipation of the rules, you know, as you said, being decades old in some cases. Mm -hmm. So regulators need to figure out what rule, rules need to be yeah. by re relaxing the, the existing rules. That makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah. But it, when you're working in sandboxes, I know there's a, here even in Ontario, we have the Ontario Securities Commission, which has Launchpad, which is creating a sandbox yeah. for um, you know, ICOs and blockchain companies. We have the Bank of Canada, which has created a sandbox environment for you know, Project Jasper, I believe they were doing. They're letting um, startups come in. They're letting financial institutions come in and start using blockchain technology to offer value-added services but you're still working with you know, preconceived notions of what money and data and assets should be like. And we, I personally, I've been in the blockchain industry for about five years now, and I'm surprised every day at the kind of innovations and ideas that are coming out. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe that we don't even know what's coming in the next five to 10 years. It's just strapping for the ride. <laughs> I, I want to explore so uh, the point you made earlier about interoperability. Um, what we talk about a consensus is a concept called end-sided markets where uh, you have different applications that it doesn't necessarily need to relate it, uh, to each other in any sort of fashion, but they share the blockchain as a rail to, um, to exchange value with one another. So if we look at an example, um, a, a bushel uh, um, could be traded for a barrel of oil where um, you, you start to increase the, um, the landscape of value being exchanged that, that are completely siloed today. Mm. Yeah. So the, it, I'm just wondering whether we could uh, foresee what kind of new opportunities, whether for financial institutions or technology firms to uh, tap into. I, I, would, I would step back. I mean, we, yeah. as Dan was saying, the, the paradigms change since 2008, a lot of people will let go and you need to re yep. reinvent yourself. So what we have now is the gig economy, or the yep. app economy. Um, and a lot of intermediaries have stepped in to, to say, you know, we'll be an Airbnb, we'll be an Uber, we'll be an uh, um, Angie's List or whatever. Um, and I think there's an opportunity in the gig economy. Now, to, to, to the point, and I was thinking about it is, uh, a lot of headlines around Uber. Some, a lot of allegations, a lot of class action uh, uh, lawsuits, and one of them coming from New York is that the, the drivers there uh, allegedly saw a, a disparity, an asymmetry in what they were getting paid versus what the customer was being charged. Right. right. And the only way they figured out that there was a disparity was they had two phones where they logged into as a customer for the same routing and um, used their the driver dashboard, if you will, to compare it. Hang on, there's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disparity here. So if you put that kind of information, if, if Uber or some gig intermediary, if you even need an intermediary, on the blockchain, you don't need, the driver doesn't need to have two yeah. phones to figure this out. It's transparent and, you know, free legal advice, you'd avoid the, uh, the class action lawsuits. <laughs> I think that's what I think. What I'm trying to say is the, the, the blockchain engenders a lot more transparency in the yeah. in the gig economy. Um, we were also talking earlier about um, the uh, uh, you know the the, the trust uh, aspect, where uh, you know culturally there are you know we're seeing uh, implied trust or distrust of organizations that have always been part of. Uh, you know the, uh, the the risk mitigation, uh, making sure that you know everything is actually uh, uh, you know accurate uh, above board, etc. Um, so, is it just about new organizations getting into that space and taking advantage of that gap in trust and using technology to uh, uh, to underline 
their, uh, their trustworthiness, or uh, how do you see that play out? Blockchain in itself um, does not entirely solve the trust problem. Um, most centralized services that exist right now are very trustworthy. Uh, they, they have lots of regulations behind them. They follow their local country AML KYC laws. They operate in a manner which is ethical. But blockchain itself, a lot of people talk about it being the be all end all of trust. And I personally believe looking at it that way is, is a problem because the technology in itself lends itself to trusted data but not trusted business practices. So uh, there's gonna be companies built using blockchain technology that may absconde with customer funds, that may do fraudulent things with the data that's trusted to them. So the technology itself has its own issues and problems. I think the people and businesses building on top of it are the ones that are gonna be solving the trust issues at the end layers. Uh, and using foundational, structurally sound blockchain technology layers as a jumping board for the future for trust. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes for questions if, uh, if any of that discussion prompted uh, some observations or questions. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Asif. Uh, I have a question here that the toughest uh, social challenges lie in areas where do not have internet coverage. So how do you address blockchain? And I heard uh, Henry mention about that UN initiative, and we heard Kenya's, Uganda's, Malawi, and all of these examples. So how do you address that last mile issue or addressing that challenge where internet doesn't exist? I think Leon's been working on that question yeah, quite a I mean, bit. Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I deal with that all the time, and you're quite right. It is, it's not necessarily lack of internet coverage, it's more lack of high-speed internet coverage. Um, I actually just published a paper and did a webinar on this last week. I did a 14-country uh, study on exactly that. I mean, it's mostly feature phones, which to, to a great extent you can't put uh, blockchain tokens on, although that, that's changing. Um, and the, 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 issue, the issue is at a regulatory level. Um, a lot of the telecom regulators don't want to mandate high-speed coverage, so they, they're more interested in universal uh, service, so you've got a 2G low speed narrowband base station in the middle of nowhere, which covers maybe um, 40 or 50 kilometers from omnidirectionally from the, from the base station, um, but there's no universal quality of service, in other words, 3G. So what you're going to have, uh, and this is changing, and again with regulatory uh, cooperation, is that the, the digital dividend of um, the the, the, the TV white spaces being refarmed for mm -hmm. mobile broadband use. So they're going to 700 megahertz. So a bit of physics, the lower the frequency, the higher the range, right? So 3G right now is at 2100 megahertz or thereabouts in most of the world. There, you need four times more base station to cover what a 2G base station does. So you're gonna see with the digital dividend a change in, in mobile broadband penetration. So it's, it's less about the coverage and more about the speed. And then you'll get people moving away from feature phones, because what's the use of using a, a smartphone, if you will, on a, on, a, on a 2G network, except it was Android, Android Go uh, announced last week, mm -hmm. which is the low bandwidth version of, of Android specifically for cheap smartphones. So you can use smartphones in a, in a 2G environment if, I, don't, I haven't seen how exactly how it's gonna work, it's just launched. But this is Google's new social right. initiative, if you will, to, to give everybody a, a smartphone in the developing world, and therefore tokens and digital ID and everything else. I think one of the things you have to keep in mind is that access to internet and data coverage and speed in itself is something that's time-based. It's not going to be the same thing 10 years from now. Um, you know, I was reading an article recently that said by 2020, something like 98% of the world is gonna have access to internet in at least local areas. So time is the solution to these kind of things, and time moves very fast. And with the adoption of blockchain technology happening at the speed it is right now, and with the increase of access to internet and internet services, I think they'll go hand in hand in you know, providing solutions eventually. I'll, I'll add from a blockchain perspective, um, the internet will eventually come, and there are a lot of innovations around blockchain to 
decrease the node size to create light wallets that you can carry around on your phone. Um, and for example, at a consensus, there's a service called Infura where you can do API calls to our services and you don't need to handle all that backend technology. So as long as the internet is there, uh, there are innovations pushing the envelope to, um, to make blockchain enabled for your, your phones. Appreciate the response, thank you. Any other uh, observations or questions? Please. Yeah, thanks for the great discussion. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm the head of innovation for the United Nations World Food Program. So thank you, Henry, for <laughs> mentioning the um, example of our, our blockchain project, which is working with 10,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan. I think the way we've overcome the input issues is around linking biometrics. And so we are biometrically registering everybody who's onto that system um, so that they're able to go, they're given an entitlement, they go to a retail store, they're biometrically checked at that point. And so I'm pretty confident our system that way is, is okay. But ironically, my question for the panel was indeed on the input side and, and ver uh, the, the verification of data. So I, I think of things like land tenure. We heard this morning that you know, 70% of the sort of small, or 70% of the land titles in the developing world are difficult to attest. And so I do wonder about how, when it comes to the point of registering your, what is kind of your de facto entitlement on a blockchain system that is gonna set you up for land tenure, how do you make sure that those, um, th that those inputs are the correct ones? And, uh, I don't know whether the, the panel has any reflections on that, but that's the kind of thing that actually does worry me as we go forward, despite the, the fact that I also have a high level of confidence in the, the, the benefits, the ultimate benefits of having uh, identity systems and uh, our own kind of payment systems and registration on the blockchain. I think Henry touched on this earlier when um, we were talking about, I believe, Uport, and we were looking at social attestation. So um, using your network and the people around you that you already deal with on a regular basis, it could be your family members, it could be your lawyer, your accountant, and using that so social attestation method to maybe get you know, land deeds and identity onto the blockchains initially. Uh, that first step is the problem. And once it's on the blockchain, then moving that around is going to be very easy. So solutions like that, I believe, are going to be part of the future. I don't know if it's going to be the final solution, but they do have some promise. There is, there is one um, uh, um, test of concept going on in Ghana on land registries. You aware of that? Yes. Uh, I mean, you've got the chicken and egg situation. I can say, you know, I, um, you see that, that valley? I own it. And <laughs> put me on the blockchain and forever I own it, right? So what's the input? What's the, how do how somebody attest so in, 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 uh, to, to my ownership? So in a lot of cases, it's a social attestation. Is the, the, the land chief, a couple of people will get together and attest to it. I mean, I'm talking get together very loosely. Mm. But th there'll be a, a process for that. Um, otherwise, anybody can say, I own the valley. So it, it, it needs, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. But th you know, the danger, of course, is if, if somebody says, I own that land and it's on a blockchain, how do you, and it's not, how do you, how do you reverse that? Exactly. That's, uh... I'll, I'll just add, in addition to those two points, uh, redundancy was probably the solution. Um, you, when you create a backup system, you're not going to create one backup system. You're going to create multiple layers, assuming that the first layer will eventually fail. Um, so you not only have your biometrics, but uh, right now when you secure your private key on the Ethereum blockchain, you can put a password around it. So password is a very simple layer. Uh, and then you can also add on ideas like multi-key signatures, where you need three out of the five people in order to uh, send a certain amount of funds or to sell your, your, piece, your parcel of land. Uh, I think that will be the solution. Thank you. Well, we've... Uh come to the end of our session. Um, thank you very much, panel, for uh, a terrific uh, conversation. And uh, it certainly uh, made me realize that uh, I still have a lot to learn. And uh, of the book recommendations that we heard about this morning, I think I'll read Amanda's book first about embracing discomfort before I read the uh, 
blockchain book. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Thanks. Thank you.